Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Catholic Coffee Talk, a podcast where in between sips we answer your Catholic questions. I'm your host, Father Brad Doyle, and I have with me our resident good Catholic, Peter Gone. Uh, Peter, have you ever petted a water buffalo? I have not petted a water buffalo. I've had a decent amount of bovine experience for a man of my background, but I can't say I've spent much time with a water buffalo. Well, this morning I pet multiple water buffaloes. Uh, there's a, a friend of mine, or I'm friend of friends of the family, the Rollins in in the pair in my pair's boundaries, uh-huh. and she started a a farm, uh, a dare, a small water buffalo dairy farm where she makes mm. cheeses. These, like, she raises chickens. Stuff. That's neat. Yeah, I I don't know what I don't know what kind of cheese other than it's not ready yet. But um, but man, those things are just. I felt like the scene out of Jurassic Park where they stop and there's the six triceratops. <laughs> and then yeah. they walk up yeah. and they put their head on the triceratops and, and feel it breathing. Breathing. Yeah. And it's like dino droppings, droppings. And that's what I felt like because there was there was some dino droppings oh, yeah. around us. Yeah. And it was just this massive animal that like just putting out heat. I mean, it was crazy. I, 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 I w- it was a pretty cool experience. I had a similar experience when I first rode horses as an adult. Because I had like been on a pony as a kid and stuff like that. But the first time as an adult I was with a horse, I was just like, oh, this is a, a large animal. This is a very large animal and is very close to me. And if he steps wrong, I'm going to lose a foot. And uh, yeah, they were so sweet, but like, oh, yeah, I was scared absolutely. just of their massive size. Like, if you lay on me, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, I don't know, it just makes you think differently about other things, about you know, uh, the life of the Holy Family with a donkey in the house and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. and then what's cool about this farm is that it's all the processes of making the cheese are, are found within the farm, like, she's mm-hmm. trying to get to this non like where there's no commercially made like cultures or this or that. It's yeah. just all Bayou Sarah cheese. And hopefully we get to sell it in our gift shop. That'd be cool. Yeah, that sounds great. So uh, I heard, did, did I hear uh, that we had some lif- listener info? Yeah. So uh, this came in about 10 minutes ago <laughs> and I just wow, wanted to wow. share it. Fresh, fresh off the press. Yeah. So this is from Dave, whose question we answered. Uh last episode about cremation you know dave from from new york we talked about upstate new york and stuff so he just wrote right back to us um (laughs) and first he got me with the joke uh because remember we said like oh we hope he actually got something out of the holy mass series and that he wasn't Mm -hmm. the insight he lacked wasn't after the fact but before the fact Mm -hmm. and and he said actually after suffering through the 30 days i became a buddhist (laughs) and i read it i was like what and he's like no not kidding i'm kidding (laughs) (laughs) well you know that would be sad for me. It would, yeah. <laughs> I, I, would, I had this moment of like, oh, no. But then and then he was, no, he was totally joking. So that made me laugh. He got me good. Um, then he just talked a bit more about that. I'll kind of just skim this. Um, but he basically said that he listened to it and he thought that we nailed it. He was really appreciative of, of the information. Uh, he said um, that you hit the nail on the head when um, you said we should think about this before it becomes a serious issue for the family. Yeah. You know, he said, uh, quote, my wife and I are approaching our mid 60s. One of my goals this year is to make a burial plans. So we've considered cremation and wanted to be sure we're within the church law and doctrine um, and so on. So, again, he's just really appreciative of uh, for the episode. And then at the end of it all, he said some more stuff. But at the end of it all, he said, since you guys are fans of old fashions, I wanted to send the recipe for another of my favorites. The black, the black Manhattan. Whoa. Also known as the. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Can I can I tell you what the Black Manhattan is? Sure. I think it's Amaro Nino instead of the vermouth. It is. Boom. And he baby. said many different families in Italy make Amaro. We insist on Nonino. Dude, me and look, I'm next time I'm up in New York, I'm coming to get a Black Manhattan with you, dude. We're on the same page. I made one three days ago. Oh, nice. This is not something yeah. I've had, so I'll have to. I'll have to get some. It's solid. It's solid. Yeah, so. and then it's you know the bitter is in the cherry and the and the orange. Yeah, yeah, of course. But the the amaro is important. Right. It's a good it's a good bottle to have on your bar because uh, black Manhattans, but also paper planes. Uh, paper plane is a fantastically balanced drink with uh, lemon. Um, so it's equal parts. It's like two thirds of an ounce of lemon juice, uh, amaro nino, um, aperol, and whiskey. 
And so it's, you got all these different, uh, you know, flavors. It's a balance. You got the bitter, you got the, the tart, you got the sweetness yeah. and you got the whiskey, which is this whole other flavor. That, that sounds I, excellent. I give, I give whiskey in its own flavor. Valid. That's valid. Anyway. So that concludes, um, Catholic cocktail talk. And <laughs> 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 well, anyway, th- I just want to thank Dave again for writing in. Cause I got a real kick out of it and appreciate having his message. Thanks, Dave. And you, too, could be like Dave or like uh, our other guests who ask questions, which brings us to what's percolating, where the questions percolating in your head get answers from the church's tradition. Usually, going to confession is uncomfortable and embarrassing. Even after decades of going, it usually doesn't get any easier. Furthermore, you probably haven't been taught anything about confession since you were seven, so your questions are still unanswered. Until now, in response to popular demand, we at Good Catholic have created a simple, straight-to-the-point mini-series that covers your most common questions and concerns, called Understanding Confession. There are six simple sessions, and we will give you confidence, peace of mind, and a new zeal for this sacrament. We'll give you tips on how to overcome fear and shame, the three things you need for a good confession, clarity on what actually constitutes mortal sin, and much, much more. So join us and our friend, Father Ken Geraci, to dive into this powerful sacrament of mercy. Click the link in the description or sign up today at goodcatholic.com. What do we have? All right, we got a question. This came in a while ago, and I apologize to Patricia, who wrote in, that we didn't get to it until now. Um, But I still think it's important, and there's still a lot of great lessons to draw from here. So Patricia wrote in to ask, or really tell us about this dilemma, she says. I have a dilemma. All through the pandemic, I've been watching Mass online. It's great, as I can use closed captions to understand everything. I have severe hearing loss. Only Mm -hmm. problem is, I can't receive communion. In church, I can follow along in the Missalette and receive communion, but I can't hear anything. Well, she says, I can hear absolutely nothing. Um, No sermons or anything spoken from the altar for years. What is the best thing for me to do? Gotcha. Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, Patricia. First, I want to affirm you in your faithfulness. Um, I'm glad that you desire to hear the word of God, to um, hear the homily, um, and 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 desire to receive the Eucharist. So there's all these desires, and it seems like they are contradictory, like in your situation. Um, and the church always wants to work with people who have particular uh, situations that might hinder them or they're hindered in some way. Um, so things like mass online are very good for people who are homebound, right? Mm -hmm. Or people who are in the hospital, um, or people who like in situations that we've had this past couple of years who are sick or, or, um, have a serious, um, issue with their immune deficiency and so they couldn't be out at certain times and things like that so the church always works with people in those situations so all of us still are obliged uh patricia to follow the third commandment which keep holy the sabbath day and part of that is uh, attending mass if at all possible but because of a privation um, we might not be able to attend Mass. So um, that person isn't held culpable for breaking the third commandment, right? So if you're right. sick and you're truly sick and you can't go or um, or what have you, some other privation, you're homebound, can't move. Um, but your situation, Patricia, strikes me as as you're able to be at, at Mass, you're able to attend Mass, which I think is really important and almost priority, uh, receiving the Eucharist, because we're as Christians, we're not... Uh, just an intellectual faith, right? Um, right. I think this is important. I, th- I wanted to start the answer with this is is um, we're not just a list. Like being a Christian doesn't mean here's a list of all the doctrines, and if you assent to all these doctrines, then you're a Christian. No, we're we're a bodily people, and we have a, a, a particular understanding of the human person that we're a body soul unity. Right. Um, and so our bodies are important. You know what where we are is important. Um, receiving the sacraments. That's why there's physical natures or, or aspects of each and every sacrament. It's not just words, and it's not just ideas. Um, you know, you pour water over the head for baptism. You receive oil in your head for anointing mm-hmm. of the sick and confirmation. Yeah. Um, and then the Eucharist, obviously under the veil of the accidents of bread and wine, but the physical physicality of the Eucharist, you receive actual 
food, right? The body, blood, yeah. soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And so you would, we do not desire you to be separate from that. So you can absolutely come, um, Patricia, and we want you to come and you should be receiving communion. Um, so come to mass. I think there's a, uh, a solution that I came up with that, um, would, would fix this. So you can okay. come receive, be a part of the mass, attend the mass. Right. And, um, and then on when you're at home or before or after, you could f- read or or uh, watch a homily with closed captioning. One that I, I think is really good is Bishop Robert Barron mm-hmm. does a, a homily series every every week. He posts his sermon, his Sunday sermon, um, and it's the featured video on a YouTube. So if you go to Bishop Robert Barron's YouTube channel, not Word on Fire, but Bishop Robert Barron's YouTube channel, uh, the featured video, they change it every week and it is his Sunday sermon and there's closed captions. I went and checked that out before oh, I good. said that. Um, so that you, you're still hearing the word preached. You're still hearing, you know, a bishop of the church and I, I, I respect him as a preacher. Absolutely. Um, and, and then you're also receiving the sacrament. So I think for you particularly, that would solve that uh, issue, Patricia. What do you think, Peter? I think that's a great solution. Um, I was thinking about this, and aside from, well, I, I think the main answer here is yes, absolutely go to Mass if you can. You know, that's, I think that's the best answer because there's graces for being at Mass. Um, and separate from that, there are graces from receiving communion, and both of those things require physical presence um, at the liturgy. So uh, like you said, I mean, Patricia has that desire and that's a good desire. Um, So absolutely affirm that and listen to that. But then in regards to the desire to hear the word of God um, and to hear preaching on it, uh, I mean, I think Bishop Barron is, is great. And I think his homilies are, are excellent um, and they're available every week. And so they're timely and they're, you know, in line with the readings So I think it's a great resource. And then I think even more broadly than that, um, this is a perfect instance where someone should, I think, get a the, the Roman Missal and follow along with the readings, because you can, yeah, you can read in the Missalette in the pew as well, and that and that that works too. I mean, it's the same thing, um, but the Roman Missal has that for all three years of the liturgical readings, and you can take it home with you. You own it, um, and then in some editions, and even if it's not in some editions, there are other ways you can get your hands on it. There are a lot of very um, old sermons like from saints like maybe from the office of readings or from this saint or that saint so maybe there's um uh, a saint or a collection of saints that you have a devotion to you could go and read some of what they've said i i've read through a good amount of saint bonaventure's sermons um you know that great friend of saint francis so there, there's a lot out there within the tradition that you can have access to that has preaching on that reading for that Sunday. And so it's a little removed from time if you go and, you know, look up a saint or uh, kind of these historical sermons because it's not here and now and this time, but it's still pertinent and it will still help your spiritual life. And so I think it can maybe still scratch that itch and fulfill that desire. Absolutely. You know, as you were speaking, it reminded me of a story or, or a warning that one of our professors gave us at seminary and it was a situation that was horrible. It still makes me squirm. Oh no. Um, he told a story and it was someone that I knew from seminary who had graduated years before, but he was like, don't be like this. Um, this particular priest was like saying mass and preaching and doing his thing. And then he sees someone on the front row kind of like looking down and reading. And he like goes out of his way, like gets out of the pulpit, like goes down and like says like, ma'am, excuse me, ma'am. And like, she doesn't pick up her head and he's like, ma'am. And he like walks down to her and he's like, ma'am, why are you reading and not listening to me? And like her husband's like, she's had a lot of seizures and she's deaf. And we were, (laughs) we were all like, ah, no, go back to the pulpit. Like it was just like one of vomit, one of vomit. So like, I'm glad that that professor, uh, told that story because it's it, we it allowed us to learn the lesson and not the hard <laughs> way right? um, and the yeah. hard way is yeah. messing up in a way that like you don't know and 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 this is how i mostly you know i strive to respond or, or just be especially from that perspective of when i'm a celebrant uh just you don't know why people are leaving mass early you know let's mm-hmm. say they leave at mass early and they're walking out and you're like 
even if like there's someone who leaves every week and you know it, maybe you'd never want to put you know the church in that situation and you in that situation that person that's leaving the situation that, that that's the one time their aunt like called them and said your p- father just passed away yeah. right and so like i've just i will never call someone out in front of everybody at church mm-hmm. or like the baby screaming or the mother or this or that or the person who's looking down and reading like mm-hmm. it's just never a good chance you don't have enough information you're not in a personal relationship with them in that very moment it's not according to what the the church says like jesus says like you have a problem go to the person first then bring mm-hmm. someone else then go yeah. to the church like so I, it's just that always scarred me <laughs> in a good way that yeah. story of just like yeah. i'm never going to do that like mm-hmm. you could probably like cut your arm off and just be like they're bleeding with your arm like hanging off i'd still just be like in the name of the father <laughs> and the son and the holy spirit <laughs> You know, like I just yep. would just continue on. <laughs> and I'm like thinking it's like most of the time, especially if I'm in the Eucharistic prayer, like I probably should be facing out orientum anyway. So like I wouldn't be seeing this. anyway. <laughs> so like the things that the congregation can do while like I'm looking at God, like fine, like I'm focusing on God. So that's how I've always mm-hmm. treated it. So um, I, I hope that's never happened to you, Patricia. Yeah, absolutely. But it brings me. OK, so Patricia, this is what I think is cool about when people ask great questions is it it like shoots us off into the direction of talk. So you're, that's your situation. I think we've answered it. Mm -hmm. I think you can receive the Eucharist uh, supplement on the weekends, but it it got me thinking about um, especially coming out of quarantine world. Right. And like, you know, whether we go back into quarantine, come out, we're going to, there's going to be various times. And, and I think sometimes people got uh, used to maybe watching mass online which was totally and not attending in person, which was totally legitimate when the bishop said you couldn't come <laughs> right, to mass right. in person. And they, uh, you know, they lifted the obligation for a time being. But unless there's a special circumstance right now, generally that obligation for those who are healthy, who fit all these criteria is still there. So like you cannot just watch it. It's not the same. It is there as a tool to supplement, to try to reach a need, mostly for the preached word of God, yep. because attending online is not attending unless you're there's some sort of physical uh, like presence in, in vicinity. So a, a, night, a situation where it would be like you're watching it on a TV, but you actually are attending would be like in an overflow situation at, at, mm-hmm. uh, for a Christmas mass or yep. like sometimes a 1030 mass where our, our cry room is in another room, but they're watching through a TV, but they're there at the church. They're yep. there at the parish. Right. And they're, they're attending mass. I w- that, that counts. Right. Mm-hmm. But like staying at home with no reason or legitimate reason um, would be breaking the commandment. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on that. And and uh, another word that I like to bring up is an old word and actually used in the Catholic Church. We so- sometimes associate it with Protestantism now, but um, I saw it used in in like old newspaper clippings from the early 1900s where like none of these priests writing in the newspaper clippings in West Feliciana were, you know, trying to utilize protestant words to be hip and cool it was literally a catholic usage and it was like referring to church on sunday or whatever as a service right Mm -hmm. and and sometimes we kind of cringe at that as catholics because it's used a lot in protestant uh circles but i think it's a good way to see mass because mass isn't just about what i get Right. It's not just about receiving something or taking something or grasping at something. Mass is about a service that we give God. Right. Right. Like we are part. We used to call it. Did you did you assist mass? Have you ever heard that phrase? Yeah. Assisting at mass. A lot of the saints, um, they refer to it that way, that they say when you assist at mass. Like they're not talking about when you're an altar server. They're talking about when you're there in the pew because you're assisting. Exactly. Because you're 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 part of the sacrifice. Yeah. They had a robust understanding of the communal aspect of the laity in the yep. mass. Yep. 
even though there's this you know falsity that people try to throw like and it completely separates like modernity from back then and be like Mm -mm. they didn't think the laity were important like no they did i mean obviously there was distortions and we needed to reclaim some of it but the saints understood that the 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 little church lady in the pew whether she was praying a rosary or not uh she was assisting the mass she was important and so like everyone not just altar servers not just cantors not just lectors everyone's assisting at mass and it is a service. So even if you can't receive communion, even if you let's say are in a persistent state of sin or, mm-hmm. or like a non-regular state, like your, your marriage hasn't been uh, convalidated yet and you're married outside of the church and the, the Lord's calling you to, to uh, you know, to chastity in that situation or to not receive communion until right. that's uh, rectified. You're still needed at mass. Yeah. And it's still an obligation. Right. Let's say you broke the fast. You you woke up and you ate a crumpet and you forgot that you're going to mass. You still got to go to mass, you yeah. know, even though you can't receive. Right. Um, and so that's I think that's something that's fruit of what Patricia asked that we got to talk about. Absolutely. Know? And I remember when we did that series on the mass for good Catholic, we we broke down the sessions to talk about one day the graces of going to mass and then a different day the graces of Holy Communion, because those are, those are different things. And being at Mass and being there and assisting with the sacrifice and offering yourself and your prayers there is really good for your soul, and it's necessary for you to do on Sundays, regardless of whether or not you go to the altar. Yep. I, I, can I end this section of what's percolating? So I want to kind of just tie the bow on it by... Uh, using the words of an early church father, Justin Martyr. I'm sure we've used him on um, on this podcast before, but this is his recollections of how the early Christians worshipped, and you'll see the similarities and how important it is to come together in, in person. He says, so he's, he's recounting this to a Roman who has no context for what Christians do. In fact, he's trying yeah. to defend the church against accusations of like, uh, I don't know, like, nefariousness or, or, or yeah, impropriety yeah. Or, or cannibalism or yeah. whatever. So he says, on Sunday, we have a common assembly of all our members, whether they live in the city or the outlying district. So you reckon this is from this first apology and it was written about 150 AD. So it's super early on. Super early. And, and he's saying that, look, people come from the country. Like they actually had to travel. Yeah. It might have taken sacrifice and it's everybody who are members. And there were no the weekends rec- back then, by the way. This like there was no such thing as a weekend, a day of rest. The Jews were weird in the eyes of like the Romans and the Gentiles yeah, yeah. because they had a day where they didn't work. Like that was weird and bizarre. So the fact that they're people are coming in from the country to, to do this on a Sunday, like that that's weird. Yeah, there but wasn't fun day Sunday culture in uh, <laughs> right. where we all go to the dog park and it's, throw our, our uh, frisbees. Yeah, you're not taking half of your weekend. You're you're taking a day off work. Wow. That's profound. Okay, so it says, and then he says, the recollections of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as there is time. So Patricia, you're right there with, you yeah. know, you want to hear the word of God? So that's the readings. When the reader is finished, the president or the presider, we mm-hmm. call him now, the priest of the assembly speaks to us. This is the homily. He urges everyone to imitate the examples of virtues we have heard in the readings. Homily, hopefully. Then we all stand together and pray, right? That's the general intercessions or the prayers mm-hmm. of the faithful. Yeah. So it's the part where it's like, you know, we pray for politicians. We pray for uh, this person. Actually, funny story. I'm going to stop right there because funny story. This past weekend, I was talking about like committing your life and like what you profess, even if it's unpopular. Uh, and, and so like being persecuted for your beliefs as a Catholic. Yeah. And I said, I mean, if you're not, if you, if everyone likes you, then you're not a prophet. You're just a politician and politicians <laughs> only want to get elected. And I look out and I see the mayor of the town <laughs> and I was like, I mean, but there's some politi- pol- some politicians are great. Some are great. <laughs> And like, I just had this high pitched and like, everyone was like, what the heck was that? Like, why'd you like backpedal? And I'm like, well, cause I didn't want to like, some politicians right. are great. I was, right, right, right. I was thinking about you didn't want that one politician to think you meant that for him specifically. Exactly. Like I was just throwing shade, like sub tweeting, sub homily tweeting him. Okay. Anyway. Um, okay. Uh, on the conclusion of our prayer, bread and wine and water is brought forward. The president of the presider offers prayers and gives thanks to the best of his ability. People give assent by saying amen or 
Amen. The Eucharist is distributed. Everyone present communicates, and the deacons take it to those who are absent. So there is this aspect of coming together. That's very important, but also mm-hmm. the, the grace received from just receiving the Eucharist, which, whoa, okay, this just happened to me. Okay, boom. I was in a conversation with uh, Ben Shaw, Presbyterian minister in my town. Mm-hmm. He's a buddy of mine, play golf, love him, um, talk often. Our golf our golf rounds are just like just us talking theology and, and stuff. And we were talking about transubstantiation and about the Eucharist and like their belief as Presbyterians and our beliefs as Catholics and what makes it different. Like he's so inquisitive and open. And he was like, yeah, I mean, we believe that the Eucharist, we believe Christ is present. I'm like, okay. Uh-huh. He's like, because the people are present. Because like everyone's come together and and like so he's present in the where two or three are gathered kind of thing mm-hmm. and the bread still just represents that. And I was like, okay, well that's very different from us. We believe Christ is present even apart from the assembly. That's why we reserve right. the blessed sacrament. We keep the blessed sacrament in the tabernacle. We would never throw that out or just eat mm-hmm. it regularly. And and look, early church representation of that. They've all gathered on Sunday. Christ is present in the word. He is present in the preaching. He is present yep. in the people who gather together. But then the deacon brings the Eucharist to the people at home. Why? Because the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, yep. and divinity of Jesus. Boom! Ben, come at me, son. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hopefully he listens to this. <laughs> I'll send it to him. It's funny. Well, Ben Shaw has come up a number of times in this podcast. I don't know if you remember that. Even in the early oh, yeah. days when you were well, yeah. to St. Francisville, you're like, oh, you're there's right. a pastor yeah. there who like, I want to golf with. And yeah. mm-hmm. so. Well, we're, we're totally buds. We're doing a, a, a theology on tap thing called oh, nice. Ither Thursday, and we're calling Golfing Buddies the Spirituality of an Ancient Game. So that <laughs> nice. was just, anyway. Nice. So It's the Ben woo! Shaw subplot of Catholic Coffee Talk. I don't think I need a pick-me-up. I think I'm picked me up enough. All right, you're but, already picked up. But Let's other go. people might. It's time for Bean of the Week. Everyone needs a pick me up. Here's ours. Peter, you got a pick me up? You got a bean? Yeah, mine. mine's weird. No, it's not weird. It's just not like, mm, it's not happy. So. <laughs> that's, that's. Well, I, no, 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 I, I am. Go with on. me. Bear with me. Um, so longtime listeners know that I, I really love sharing music here Mm -hmm. um, in this space and I recently rediscovered I've known about it for a while but I recently rediscovered um, a certain setting of the Agnus Dei Mm. um, which is arranged to the same music as Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings and Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings is a piece of music that a lot of people have heard, but no one knows that they've heard it. It just like shows up in different movies and TV mm-hmm. shows. And it's like mm-hmm. the saddest, like sad, sad music you've ever heard. Um, there's nothing quite like it. And it's beautiful, but it's not like a pick me up. It's a pick me up because it's edifying and it's mm-hmm. rewarding. But um, someone took that piece of music and turned it into a choral arrangement of the Agnus Day. Which is beautifully fitting, you know, you know, have mercy on us and, and grant yeah, us peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's the, the, the lamb, you know, the lamb of God is, is the slain lamb, the victorious lamb. Yeah. But, you know, he had to be slain first. So. Yeah. And so it's a, a beautiful, haunting, rewarding piece of music. And it's not exactly happy. Um, but if you're in a penitential mood or you're going into kind of repentant kind of prayer and you want to have something to kind of meditate on or, or kind of pray with as you listen to music, if that's kind of your speed, um, this is a great, a great piece to have kind of on the shelf. It doesn't happen to be in the movie, the tree of life. Is it? I know the end scene uh, of the tree of life, which is a very sad <laughs> movie, uh, is, is an on day be. setting. It might be. I've seen that movie once. And this is the kind of piece that would show up in a movie like that. Hold on. If only there were a device where we could look this up. No, it's written by Hector Berlioz is the, uh, the Agnus Dei, uh, Oh, okay. Well, the Requiem hitting by Berlioz, but yeah. So sorry. Well, I thought that was going to be cool. It it could be. Is it more? No, I think Berlioz is like a contemporary because he wrote a bunch of other stuff for the movie. Okay. But anyway, I News Day is such a sweet. Oh, 
sorry. So I, I just looked it up too. It was Samuel Barber himself who also said it to the, the voice of Anya's day. So he did both. He did the strings and then he also put it in, uh, uh, into the church music, into the Anya day. That's awesome. So, and you know, if people have a, a problem with that, you know, like a, a originally secular piece being said eventually to, um, you know, for the, for a mass setting, uh, you know, it's not necessarily all these are supposed to be used at the mass. Uh, sometimes just the greatest words, the most profound words, which are scripture and the mass have created creativity or, or provided the, the yeah. source of creativity for the greatest musicians ever and Absolutely. greatest artists ever. So you think of the great liturgical art, which is the epitome of um, man's ability to to depict uh, truth and beauty. Um, so like, you know, uh, Da Vinci and, and Michelangelo mm-hmm. and then some like Mozart and all these guys, like they, they, they're some of their greatest works, their opus, you know, magnum opus is a mass. Right. right. And so and another, another example of this would be Holtz taking his Jupiter, one of the planet, uh, yeah. his Jupiter is planet symphony. And like, it's the great hymn we love all love right. oh god beyond all praise mm-hmm. probably my favorite hymn me too it's so solid okay so here's my pick me up um i started a youtube channel for my parish uh mm-hmm. the youtube channel is called feliciana catholic because we're in the felicianas of louisiana um so f-e-l-i-c-i-a-n-a catholic um and the first little series or type of video that's going to be a playlist is called choir practice with father Brad. And this is so that I can introduce certain pieces of music, certain settings of the mass, certain chants and, and even contemporary songs that we're using for like the second part of communion, like the reflection song. Uh-huh. Um, I can introduce it to the people like outside the context of mass and outside, you know, right before mass, which is not really good. So instead they can go practice like the Ave Regina of Chilorum, uh, which is what's coming up. Uh, we're about to change. Lent, Actually, today, right? today, it oh, is really? the pr- presentation of Jesus. Oh, so yeah. From here on out, we use the, uh, or we're recording this presentation of Jesus, and we use the Ave Regina Celorum as the um, the Marian antiphon. So we close all our masses. Our recessional hymn is the uh, proper Marian antiphon for the time period we're in. So I kind of give a history, translation, we practice it, and it's on YouTube, so go check it out. That's awesome. Well, you just gained one more subscriber right here as you said that. So nice. Sweet. It's all it's all about the clicks, baby. That's all I'm about. <laughs> I'm just I'm just joking. You've been listening to Catholic Coffee Talk with me, Father Brad, and your resident good Catholic, Peter Gone. Coffee Talk is brought to you by the Catholic Company and is part of the Good Catholic Podcast Cooperative. If this episode has blessed you, you can find more content at goodcatholic.com. As always, we ask you to leave a review, a rating, share the pod with a friend, or simply pray for us and our mission. If you have a question of your own that has been percolating, shoot us an email at askapriest at goodcatholic.com, or you can leave a voice message at speakpipe.com slash catholiccoffeetalk. We might feature your message on a future episode, or we'll answer all your questions to the best of our ability. To quote the psalmist, taste and see that the Lord is good. Continue to drink deeply from our great faith. We'll talk next week. Peace. Peace.